Bibles with you tonight, I invite you to open them to Exodus chapter 1. Tonight we're beginning a brand new sermon series on Sunday night. It's starting tonight. It'll take us through June, July, and parts of August. The name of the sermon series is The Life and Times of Moses. You're going to get ten different messages by nine different speakers as we go through this series. But I'm starting us off tonight with a message entitled, Waiting on God. Waiting on God. If you'll bring your Bibles with you each and every service, you'll always get 50% more out of every message you hear. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? So bring your Bible with you and follow along as much as you can. Exodus chapter 1, beginning with verse 6, 7, and 8, but we'll be looking at the whole chapter and part of Exodus 2. Remember, every word in the Bible has a purpose. Every statement in the Bible has a reason. Verse 6 of Exodus chapter 1, And Joseph died. All his brothers and all of that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty in number. And the land was filled with them. Verse 8, Now there arose a new king, a new pharaoh over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. Under old Pharaoh, the Israelites grew in number to over two million people strong in Egypt. Though they were slaves, the Israelites were treated respectfully and reasonably well by their Egyptian uh, slave owners. In other words, the Israelites who were slaves had a very good relationship with the Egyptians who were their their masters. That was why Joseph was alive. That's why old Pharaoh was alive. But things have changed. If you live long enough, things will change. Not always for the better. Joseph has died. Old Pharaoh is gone. And now there's a new Pharaoh in town. A new Pharaoh has taken the throne of Egypt. He doesn't care about what old Pharaoh did. He doesn't even know who Joseph was. And new Pharaoh, he's got mental issues. And he's got heart issues. He's paranoid and he's sadistic. History tells us he was crazy in mind and he was cruel in heart. He believes that the Israelites are not friends to the Egyptians. In fact, he believes they're enemies, just waiting on a chance to rebel against their masters and overthrow his government and take over Egypt. That's what he believes. He has no reason to believe it, but that's what he believes in his mind. That's what he believes in his heart. And because of what he believes, that affects every behavior that he shows toward the Israelites. And so he orders them to become workers. They used to be workers under old Pharaoh, but they were treated, as I said, with respect. They were treated reasonably well. They were given a minimal number of hours to work. But new Pharaoh, he's going to change all of that. No longer will they be domestic workers. They're now going to work in the fields. They're now going to work in the construction industry. They're going to plant crops. They're going to harvest crops. They're going to build buildings. And they're going to do it from sunrise to sundown. They're going to do it And it's going to be long, and it's going to be hard, and it's going to be hot, and it's going to be exhausting. It's going to be grueling labor. Because he believes if he keeps them busy and wears them down and wears them out working seven days a week, 
16 hours a day, they will not have time to rebel against him. They'll be too tired to do that. But the Bible says, even though he's working them hard, working them long, many of them are dying in the construction field, many of them are dying in the fields, the number of the Israelites keep what? Increasing. You would think they would decrease because of the number of deaths in the fields and in the construction sites. But the Bible says, if you noticed in verse 7, that their numbers continue to grow. Their numbers continue to increase. And Pharaoh is concerned because the more Israelites they are, the greater chances they would have if they rebel to overthrow him. So he comes up with another plan. Not only will he work them 16 hours a day from sunrise to sundown, not only is he going to work them in the fields till their tongue drops out of their mouth, not only is he going to work them on construction sites, from foundations all the way to the top, he's now going to order that all baby boys who are born at birth to an Israelite or a Hebrew woman, that newborn baby, when it leaves the womb of its mother, is to be killed. The midwives who deliver these babies are under orders from Pharaoh. If that baby comes out and it's a boy, you kill it. You murder it. He's proposing now a genocide against the Jewish race, targeting newborn baby boys. Can you believe that? That's what he's doing. Certainly, if he starts killing these newborn baby boys, this will slow down the growth of the Hebrews and the Israelites. They won't be so many in number. But the Bible says that doesn't work. Despite this order, despite this policy, despite this edict, the Israelites continue to grow. They continue to increase. Their numbers continue to go up. Even with the death of so many of them in the fields and the construction work. Even with the death of the infant baby boys. So Pharaoh comes up with a new edict. I told you he was crazy, did I not? And he's wicked. His new policy now is, not only will... We work them to death in the fields and in the construction site. Not only will we take the life of every newborn baby boy that comes into this world, he will be murdered. But I'm going to gather up all the baby boys. Those who have been born before I came into power, I'm going to gather them all up. And they're going to be drowned in the Nile River. They're going to become food for the crocodiles. And that was his order. Can you imagine somebody so crazy, so sadistic, a madman and a murderer? That's the new Pharaoh. And the Israelites and the Egyptians who had a working relationship now have become enemies because of Pharaoh. It's under all of this umbrella of death that Moses comes into the world. His parents know that when he is born, what the midwife is supposed to do with him. His parents know that when they receive him from the midwife, if the midwife doesn't take his life the moment he leaves the womb, they as parents are supposed to take him to the Nile River and drown him themselves to allow the crocodiles to consume him. That's what they know they have to do, but they don't do it. 
I believe in following the laws of the land unless the laws of the land contradict the word of God. And then we make a choice what we're going to do and I pray that you'll follow Jesus. And whatever consequences come from it, comes from it. But the law of God trumps the law of government. And Moses' parents say we can't do this. We're not taking the life of our son. We believe he's a special son. We believe he's a promised son. We believe God has a purpose and reason for his life. We're not going to take his life. And so they put him in a floating basket. And they sailed him down the Nile River. They were going to protect him from drowning. And they prayerfully prayed that God would protect him from the crocodiles. Of course, if you know the story, and most of you do, Pharaoh's daughter, Pharaoh's own daughter, sees the floating basket. She calls for her Hebrew assistants to bring the basket to her. It just so happens that her assistants are Moses' sister and Moses' mother. And they bring baby Moses to her in the basket. God tenders her heart far beyond what a mother would normally have for a child. God tenders her heart. She falls in love with that little baby boy. She says, I'm not going to hurt him. I'm taking him back to the palace. I'm going to make him my son. God does have a sense of humor sometimes, doesn't he? And then she got to thinking, I need somebody to take care of this little fella. I've got things I've got to do as royalty. I've got things I have to do as, as, a, as a budding queen. And so she said, well, you two ladies, <laughs> you come to the palace. I want you to take care of him. And Moses' mother says, I'll be glad to. But she doesn't know that's mother's, Moses' mother. And Moses' sister says, I'll be glad to take care of him too. And she says, both of you are hired. I'm going to pay you a wage, take care of him. And that's what happens in Exodus chapter 1. Moses is born. Moses was preserved and protected as a baby, as a little boy by God himself. Because Moses is God's selection to be the deliverer and the redeemer of God's people from Egypt. Now that's the story that you will find in Exodus chapter 1 going in to part of Exodus chapter 2. That's the story. But I'm a Paul Harvey man. And every story has a what? The rest of the story. Because remember, this is not just a story about Moses. It's a story about you and I. What can we learn tonight? What can we leave here with tonight? As we look at Moses, as we look at the times in which he was born, the life that he lived early on. Four things I want to give you real quick. First of all, I think we can see from The story I just told you, God keeps his word. God keeps his word. God is a God of promise. What God says is what God does. What God does is based on what God has said. The Bible is a promise book. It's filled with promises, and God will keep every single one of them. Good place for an amen. God keeps his word. Look at verse 7, verse 12, and verse 20. Remember, every verse is there for a reason. But the children of Israel, verse 7, were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty in number, and the land was filled with them. Everywhere you looked, there was an Israelite. Verse 12. But the more they afflicted them, This is speaking of the Egyptians afflicted the Israelites. The more the Israelites multiplied and grew. The more we buried, the more that were born. 
They were dying in the fields. They were dying on the construction sites. But every time we turn around, we're burying one. And we got three more coming to take his place. Doesn't make any sense, does it? But that's what God says here. And they were dreading the children of Israel. Notice verse 20. They're going to decrease in number, right? I mean, after all, Pharaoh's ordered them to be killed. Their number's going to have to go down, right? Therefore, verse 20, God dwelt with the midwives. And the people, what? Multiplied and grew very mighty. Three times God reminds us in Exodus chapter 1 that what he says is what he's going to do. He keeps his word. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? The Lord had told Abraham, the first patriarch, if you recall, that he was going to give him descendants one day that would be greater than all the stars in the sky. In other words, God was going to give Abraham descendants that would come out of his loins that would be too innumerable to count. You can't count the stars in the sky. You will not count the descendants of Abraham. And people said impossible. God is overstated this time. Because Abraham's an old man. Sarah's an old woman. They don't have a dozen kids in them. They may not even have one in them. But they did have one, didn't they? One son to an old couple. But God said he was going to give them untold numbers like the stars. But the longest journey begins with what? The first step. A million descendants begins with what? One person. And his name was Isaac. And from that came Jacob, came Joseph. When Joseph went to Egypt, he had 70 Israelites with him. So we got one who becomes 70 after four generations. And then after 12 generations following the arrival of Joseph into Egypt, 12 more generations, now the number of Israelites have went from 1 to 70 to 2 million. No wonder the Egyptians felt threatened. There was Israelites everywhere. Just as God said there would be. Abraham, I'm going to give you descendants, ancestors that will be like the stars. They cannot be counted. From 1 to 70 to 2 million. <laughs> and they said what? Impossible. All things are possible with God. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the promises and the word of God is for what? Forever. I, I think the Israelites have forgotten what God said. That's why God says it three times. Because we forget too. But what he's saying is, I gave my word to Abraham. He was going to have descendants and they were going to be a bunch of them. And I'll keep my word to him. And it doesn't matter what a new Pharaoh says. It doesn't matter what a new Pharaoh does. I am going to prosper the descendants of Abraham. I'm going to give him more than he could have ever imagined he would have. So God keeps his word. Not just about descendants of Abraham, but to you and I. When you're going through a difficult time, you find a promise from God in the Bible. And hang on to that promise because God will deliver. Secondly, God uses bad to make good. I think we see that in Exodus chapter 1. God uses bad to make good. It says in verse 11, Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. This is speaking of the Egyptian taskmasters. These are, these are people hired by Pharaoh to get every ounce of work he can 
out of the Israelites who work in the fields and work on the construction sites. And if they don't deliver to afflict them or to kill them. And it says that they afflicted the Israelites with these burdens as they built for Pharaoh supply cities at Pidim and Ramesses. In Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good, for them that love God and are called according to his purposes. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God has your interest at hand? When God makes decisions, you're on his mind. He's going to do what's right and best for you. And though it appears to be bad at the moment, that bad will be transformed to good if you just stay with him. Don't bail out on him. Don't quit on him. Don't tap out. Just go the distance. And he will be a God of transformation. He'll change your bad to good. Now think about it. How in the world is God going to take something bad and make it good in Egypt? There's a new Pharaoh. He's crazy. He's sadistic. There's a new edict that says we're going to work the Hebrews to death. There's another new edict that says when baby boys are born into the world, they're to be slaughtered, they're to be murdered, they're to be killed. There's another edict that says all baby boys, no matter when they were born, are going to be thrown in the Nile River and eaten by the crocodiles. There's policies and orders in place that we're going to make the Israelites' life hard and brutal and harsh. No more easy life for them. This is all bad. Would you not agree? Every bit of that I just told you. But God said, I will take the bad and make it good to those that love me and are called according to my purpose. Why did God Allow that bad, and what was the good that was going to come out of it? Well, let me say this. His thoughts are not my thoughts, and his ways are not my ways, nor yours. God doesn't tell me when he's about to do something why he does it. And he doesn't tell you either. He just says, trust me. We don't live by explanation, we live by faith. Faith says, I don't need to understand, I just believe. And God can work it all out. So how is the bad going to come become good? Well, listen, when the Israelites had it made under old Pharaoh, they were slaves, but they were treated just like citizens. Respectfully, reasonably well. They got nice food to eat. They wore fairly nice clothes. They had a chance for education. They could worship their God without any problem. When they had all of that, listen to me, why would they ever want to become free? Why would they ever want to leave Egypt and go to the promised land that God has promised them? They wouldn't. God had to allow, God allowed it. God didn't cause it, but he allowed it. God allowed the new Pharaoh to come on the scene. God allowed this crazy man, this wicked man, to impose these edicts, these policies, these ordinances, these laws on the Israelis. You know why? Because he wanted them to have a change of mind, a change of heart about where they were going to stay and where they were going to go. It was by making things tough on them that they said, we don't want to be in Egypt no more. It was by th making things tough on them that they said, we're willing to leave. Give us a leader. We'll follow him. We'll go to another place, God. That was the good. You see, we get comfortable sometimes, don't we? And God steps in and he allows things to happen that we might feel are uncomfortable, painful, hurtful, difficult. Why does he do that? 
Why does he allow that? Well, maybe one of the reasons is to shake us out of our comfort zone. Because he doesn't want us where we're at. He wants us to go somewhere else. He doesn't want us doing what we're doing. He wants to to move us into another place of service. God is a God of, of not a static. He's not a static God. He's a God of movement. And he's constantly moving his people to places. He's constantly moving his people into things that they will be better and they can make things better for others and that they can bring him glory. That's what he does. And so the bad was necessary to change the minds and the hearts of the Israelites that they would want to leave Egypt and follow Moses or somebody to a new land. Thirdly, we learn in Exodus chapter 1 that God is in no rush. God keeps his word, does what he says. God uses bad to make good. We thirdly learn that God is in no rush. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9, part of the verse says, The Lord is not slow concerning his promises, but he's patient. He's not slow about his promises, he's just patient. Hundreds of years have passed since God has made these promises to Abraham. And God has not forgotten what he said to Abraham. Abraham may have forgotten it. He's dead. Isaac forgot it. Jacob forgot it. Joseph forgot it. Most of the Israelites have forgotten it. But God hasn't forgotten it. God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you a vast land. I'm going to give you a great nation. I'm going to give you uncountable descendants. I'm going to give you a blessed redeemer that will be a blessing not just to you, my people, to you, my nation, but to the entire world. And time has passed and nothing has happened. One generation comes and goes. Another generation comes and goes. Another generation comes and goes. Where's God? He said he was going to do it. Why hasn't he done it? Has he forgotten? Has he become senile? Is he on vacation? Has he resigned? Has he been overthrown? Has God died? Where's this vast land that he said he was going to give to his people? Where is this great nation he said he was going to form for his people? Where's the uncountable descendants he said he was going to give to his people? Servant Abraham, where's the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Deliverer that he said he was going to bring through them to the world? Where's he at? Where's these things at? You ever ask God, where's he at in regard to the promises he's made to you? How long, God? Why are you taking so long? You know what the rest of 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 says? It gives us the answer why God seems to be slow. God seems to be patient with things that we would rush through if we were in charge. The Lord is not slow about his promises, but he is patient. Not wishing that any should perish, but all may come to life. Let me ask you a question. Did God love the Egyptians? Did God love the Egyptians? We know he loved the Israelites. They were his people. We know he loved the Hebrews. They were his people. Did he love the Egyptians who were the masters of his Hebrews, of his Israelites? Did God love this new Pharaoh who's a madman and a murderer? Did he love the Egyptian taskmasters, cruel men who worked the Hebrews to death? Did God love those midwives 
who followed what Pharaoh said and drowned those little boys, murdered those little boys. Did God love the Egyptians? Look up here at Did he? Absolutely. And that's why God moves slowly at times, but he moves. Because he's offering grace and mercy to a nation and to a people and to individuals of people. That he wants to try to save. And he gives them a lot of time to come around. Fools rush in. Because they don't have an understanding of God. The devil rushes because his time is short. But God never rushes. God moves methodically. Surely. Patiently. Because God is trying to reach people that we wouldn't try to reach. That's why he does what he does. God was trying to reach the Egyptians. He wanted to save that new Pharaoh. He wanted to save those taskmasters. He wanted to save this Egyptian nation and these Egyptian people. He wanted to save them. We don't, but he did. And so when you ask, where is God? What are you up to, God? Maybe there's somebody in your family circle God's trying to reach. And he's going to use your pain, your, your delay to accomplish it. God is in no rush because God wants to give people ample time to get saved. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad God gave me some time. I'm glad God said, I'll give you another day, another month, another year. Because I was far from him at one time, just like you were. I'm sure glad God didn't just step in and say, well, you've had two chances. You're out of here. He gives us multiple chances, far more than we ever deserve. Fourthly, God allows pain and hurt. To bring us to himself. God allows pain and hurt. To bring us to himself. God keeps his word. Shake your head. You know that. He keeps his word. What he promises is what he does. He uses the bad that we would perceive. To make things good. Every bad thing has a purpose. That God will use to make good. If we'll trust him. God is in no rush. He's in no hurry. God is, moves patiently because he's gracious and he's merciful and he wants to save people. We don't want to save them, but God does. And lastly, verse 13 and 14. God allows pain and suffering to bring us to himself. Look at verse 13 and 14. The Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with harshness, or rigor is that word that's used. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage. This is the Egyptians now. This is how they're treating the Israelites under new Pharaoh. They made their lives bitter with hard bondage, and mortar, and brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was harsh and cruel, difficult and mean. The purpose of pain and suffering that we have in our lives, God sometimes uses that to get the attention of us that we will turn to him. The evil of Pharaoh was used by God to have the Israelites cry out for a deliverer and a redeemer. If he didn't put them through the pain and the suffering, the Israelites, they would have said, we're going to stay in Egypt. We've got it made in Egypt. We're satisfied with being slaves. We're happy with being slaves. God said, I didn't save you to be slaves. 
I didn't make promises to you to live under somebody else's rule. You're my people. I have a land for you. And if you don't want to go of your own accord, I'm going to move you out. By making things so painful and hurtful, so problemsome, so troublesome, that you will want to leave. See, God uses pain and suffering in our lives that we might cry out to him and do what he would have us to do. Do you know it took the evil of the Assyrians and the Persians and the Babylonians throughout Israel's history to get God's people to cry out and say, God, we're so sorry for our sin. We're so sorry for our idolatry, our immorality, our injustice. God, forgive us. Give us another chance. It was only when the, when the Assyrians and the Persians and the Babylonians put the Israelites under their heel and rubbed them into the ground that the Israelites begged for God to step in. And they promised they would forsake their sin and follow him. It was under the evil Roman Empire that God used to make the Israelites cry out, Oh God, we want a personal relationship with you. We've got a dead religion led by corrupt men. Lord, give us the Messiah. Do you know the people in Jesus' day were looking for the Messiah? They were tired of the dead religion. And God was using that dead religion and that bunch of crooks called Pharisees and Sadducees to get God's people to cry out for the Messiah. Do you know the evil of Adolf Hitler in World War II against the Jewish people? God used that, that they would cry out and ask the world for a homeland for their people where a holocaust could never occur again. And God used the brutality that the Nazis showed to the Jewish people to get the Security Council, which has never happened before and will never happen again, to agree with unanimity to make Israel a state, a country on its own. You see, God used the pain and suffering of a nation to bring that nation to himself. One day, God's not through with the nation of Israel, by the way. He's not through with the Jewish people because that nation and those people are once again far from God. So God is going to use the brutality of a man called the Antichrist and under his heel and under his harshness, they're going to cry out in the tribulation period for him to come. They're going to accept Jesus as their Savior. They'll see that the one they crucified was the one that they should have worshipped. They'll see it. And they'll come back to the God. What's true of a nation, in closing, is true of individuals, too. God will bring things into our life to rattle our cage and get our attention. Because he wants to do something in our life to bring us to himself. I'm not saying every health condition you and I have God is behind it, but I'm telling you, God uses it. God uses financial woes. God uses abusive relationships. God uses the death of a loved one. God uses the loss of in a tragedy. God uses the betrayal of a friend. God uses things to shake us up and show us we need him. Because sometimes... You'll never know the Lord is all you need. To he's all you have. And we can be a stubborn people sometimes. He calls us to come to him. With the things he brings into our life. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.